Doran, mate, firstly, thank you for coming back on. Last time you and I spoke um, a couple of months ago was on the ground in Israel. And since then, you've been on the ground inside of Gaza. Firstly, mate, how, how are you doing? <laughs> well, basically, I'm recovering. Um, about 90% of my guys uh, all have uh, injuries from the missions that we carried out. Um, we don't have, uh, what do you call it, the combat injuries in the sense of that we didn't get hit or, or wounded by the enemy, but just the mission itself, the, the, the routine, the day in and day out, uh, being in Humvees and getting smacked around and, and whatnot from, from just uh, very difficult terrain that we've been operating in uh, in the Strip has uh, unfortunately given most of us, uh, uh, you know, one of my guys has a broken arm, shoulders, elbows, you name it. So uh, right now we're in recovery mode. Uh, most of my guys are each one doing their process of recovering. And um, yeah, getting back to life as normal, so to speak. Uh, this is our one week out of the combat uh, service until we meet up again. Uh, later this week, and um, and then and then basically uh, finalize our our uh, our service of the four months uh, plus that we've been fighting uh, in Gaza. So yeah, so it's 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 the out process. It's going to be speaking with shrinks. It's going to be the whole the whole deal, and um, it's actually the first time I think in my over twenty years of service that we've had such a uh, you know, such a process to go through because other battles in the past, you know, we have, a, a, it, it's like an operation in Gaza, an operation in Lebanon, what have you. It's in, you're out, you're done, move on. Here it's like this chunk of your life. And, and it, it seems like the military is also treating it in a different way than other, uh, than other wars that we've had. So it's a little bit surreal in a way. It's a little bit uh, different. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you have your routine from, years of service and now it's like wait we're gonna sit down with a shrink now and we're gonna do this and you know so it's it's all new in a way uh but also you know same old same old military stuff sign off your gear check out over here etc yeah so there's always the pointless things that stumble you too like i know i got in shit for not having like a issued fork and spoon yeah exactly so look, <laughs> after we spoke last, you know, you guys were heading into Gaza. How did that yeah. sort of evolve? How did things change there? What what was the feeling on the ground when you actually entered? Uh, so when, when we met last, we were carrying operations from outside of the Strip and in and out. Um, then we moved into a Ford operating base, I guess you call it, inside the Gaza Strip in mm -hmm. the Sajaya area the just the very southern part of Gaza City so the northern part of the operations and so um, essentially we would go in for longer periods of time um, and stay in a in, in in one of the homes in Gaza using that as your you know your compound so to speak your temporary uh, place to carry operations out of um, so yeah I mean it, you, you could say, it, it it the 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 op tempo kind of intensified the uh operations of the military got more aggressive um and yeah you could you could just feel the whole uh, the progression of the mil of, of of the operations you know basically getting into a higher intensity and maneuvering into the terrace uh uh where the terrorists are basically held up in a in a in a urban civilian populated area, right? So where we would find these hotbeds were hospitals, schools, mosques, uh, kindergartens. Um, yeah, in any one of those places, you would find the terrorists were either had uh, uh, caches of weaponry they were operating out of. Um, most of them were operating in civilian clothing, so it made it made the distinguishing between you know good guy bad guy much more difficult 
And that's also part of their tactic is to, to uh, if, if they do get shot and killed by the military, when they go and, you know, take a, a an AK or an RPG and fire it at our, our, our forces so that when they get shot and killed from the, from the returning fire, then as far as Hamas is concerned, that's another civilian that got, you know, marked off as another civilian casualty from the war. So the miracle of miracles, um, after all the Air Force uh, uh, airstrikes and the military maneuvering in and out of the Gaza Strip areas where the terrorists are held, there are no terrorists that are dying. You know, they're like, you know, invincible, apparently. Um, so only only civilian casualties, only civilians are dying in the Gaza war. Um, and so that's just something that I think for people who are watching this and that you're probably familiar with the claims that Israel is committing a genocide, then you need to realize that's what we're up against. We're up against an enemy who doesn't play fair. We're up against an enemy that that um, hides itself as a civilian, when in reality, they're using that tactic to mess with our forces, to make it easier for them to fire at our forces without being uh, identified as a as a combatant, uh, at least not at first hand, right? So if you have like a drone ab above that's assessing the battle space, imagine the, the, that they're trying to pick out the bad guy out of a crowd of people, and unless they see a weapon sticking out or what have you, there's no way to distinguish the bad guys. Um, and I think another thing that we noticed as we were operating inside the Strip uh, we eventually found ourselves down in Hanunas as the military uh, uh, progressed down south. Um, is that what I noticed is that everywhere you looked, there was a terrorist infrastructure within every corner of society. So, for example, when when you know wherever you guys are viewing from, wherever you're living, right? Imagine you go to the grocery store, and on your way to the grocery store. First thing, when you walk out of your house, there's a terror tunnel um, um, a shaft, that, you know, opening in the ground, leading down into an underground terror tunnel that terrorists are using. So imagine as you walk out your door, that's what you'll see first thing, right? And then you walk to the grocery store along the way, you'll see another terror tunnel just by a kindergarten. And then you'll see another one by the local mosque. Or you go into a hospital. And in the hospital, there's an opening, another shaft leading down into a tunnel out of the local hospital, right? Um, UNRWA, uh, the United Nations uh, compound in Gaza, the headquarters, was used to house uh, am ammunition and using resources from from the United Nations to to um, uh, assist the terrorists. In other words, using vehicles that are, are marked with United Nations, right, the big UN, um, and using that to transport either munitions and or uh, terrorist fighters from a location to another, using ambulances as well as uh, using that undercover to maneuver um, the different uh, terrorists from one place to another. Um, so essentially what we found wherever we went in Gaza, either up in the north area, down in, in Khan Yunus, what, what I kept seeing a repetition of is that the, the, the culture of terrorism is in every part of life, okay? So the one house that we were in, for example, I remember uh, seeing a report card from one of the kids of, of, the, of the family that, 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 that had... Uh, resided in the home that we were using. And so I remember looking at the report card and thinking, wait, what is this? Because it sees you see a picture of Yasser Arafat and Mahmoud Abbas, you know, walking together, right? Like that's on the front cover of your report card. You open it up and inside again, you have Yasser Arafat, Mahmoud Abbas, and then uh, congratulations to whoever. Uh, this certificate certifies that you graduated third grade, third grade or whatever, right? So imagine like every part of your life has the imprint, the 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 marketing of these terrorist uh, entities. Um, trying to think, oh, I took it away, I think. Ah, I'll get it for you. 
Yep. You guys got to see this. <laughs> so, you know how, like, for Christmas in the West, you guys print mugs and, you know, Merry Christmas, Santa Claus, you know, yay. Yeah. Well, this is what these guys print out and oh, send yeah. out instead. This is what we found in a home. In a home. Not, I'm not talking about a terrace. Uh, uh, and you see there the terrace uh, insignia, etc. Yeah. So it's like everything is marketed there. You, you know what I'm saying? Everything is marketed around these terrace groups. Um, you know, their flags are in every corner of the strip. I'm not going to pull the whole thing out. But this right here is Muslim Brotherhood with the, with the uh, Hamas uh, green colors. Uh, classic for Hamas and so on. Um, so imagine like every home, every home, everywhere we turn, public spaces, uh, municipalities, everything has the stamp of terrorism embedded in it. And what I found from seeing that was that it was very, very disappointing because what it showed me is that no matter how hard we fight the terrorists, and how many terrorists that we eliminate, that the it, it, that these young children right now that are hiding away from the battle space, those that were able to make it to um, uh, to the Rafiah, uh, southern part of the Gaza Strip, where the military has made a security corridor and has allowed the civilians to hide there and trucking supplies daily, food, medical, you name it to the, the civilians, of, you know, the civilians of the Gaza Strip. And the reason why I say the civilians is because um, what I've learned is that there are no civilians in this war. You know, it's like what Hamas has accomplished since I was last in Gaza in 2004. That's when I operated there last before the pullout in 2005. Um, I was in a unit that fought in the Gaza Strip and I was in Khan Yunus. And in all these places that we're in now, and it wasn't at all, at all like what we're seeing right now. What it used to be is that we knew what families, which groups were not pro-terrorists. We know we knew who we could have good relationship with. We knew which of the Palestinians could work in farms and agriculture, or what have you, in in the in the Jewish uh areas where they would come in and work and then go back home like we knew who we could trust you know and it's like now it's like i don't know who is who's 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 innocent here it's like what the terrorists have managed to do since 2005 is to brainwash a whole generation of young kids into hating israel into embracing terrorism as a means of life and then that's the only future and hope for them. Um, that's pretty sad, you know. And another thing that people need to understand, uh, if you've ever heard of the Marshall Plan, the Marshall Plan is what what basically the lead, those who, who, who were the victors of the war, War II war, they made a plan on basically – streaming funds into rebuilding all of Europe from the destruction of World War II. And for those who understand and know anything about history, we're talking about massive, massive, massive uh, infrastructure needing to be rebuilt and so on and so forth. And so it's in today's money, you're looking at, I think, $170 billion, give or take. And with, with uh, you know, with today's uh, uh, currency. So imagine that much money has been has been pumped into the Gaza Strip alone since I don't know, let's say year two thousand ish. That money has gone towards helping the Palestinians, foreign aid to the Palestinians, give them more money, more money, more money, and take that money and double it times five. Okay, is a if I remember the numbers correctly, it's about five times what went into all of Europe, so 170 billion times five, that's how many billions of dollars, US dollars, has gone into one small strip of land with foreign aid. 
And all in the best that the Palestinians could accomplish is a massive underground infrastructure. Instead of building schools and hospitals and making them proper, right? Because they have more hospitals, by the way, per capita than we do in Jerusalem. And it's about the same population you're looking at. So the same population in Jerusalem and the four hospitals, major hospitals that serve all of the population of Jerusalem, they have over 20 in the Gaza Strip. Okay. So imagine over 20 hospitals, and yet the Palestinians still come to Israel and to Israeli hospitals to get major uh, uh, procedures done, and not in all the huge amount of number of, 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 of hospitals that they have in the Gaza Strip. So what I'm saying is people need to understand tons and tons of money has got into this industry of terrorism, and what it's produced is a whole society that's revolving around terrorism, and if anybody wants to resist that, of course, they're going to die. So there's not going to be anybody who's going to resist because they've made sure through through fear and intimidation and torture that you don't want to resist us. So even for those who don't want to embrace that lifestyle, it's all it's all going to be around you anyways. Your kids are going to hear it in school anyways. You know, so what I'm saying is it's like if you're in Gaza, you have you have no future. You have no hope. And to me, that's very sad. And that all this money has been spent on helping build them a massive underground infrastructure that's over 500 miles of underground tunnel systems um, instead of putting it into proper schools, proper hospitals, proper education. In fact, you could have Ivy League schools in the Gaza Strip. You could have the top uh, tourist locales in the world because they have beachfront uh, properties. You could have had the Garden of Eden, you could have had, you know, the Dubai of the Middle East here with that much money that's been pumped into the terrorist uh, entities that have mismanaged all these funds and instead of created a living hell for the Gazans. And, and so that? that's what why, I witnessed. Why has the Hamas, you know, government there and the terrorists which you're fighting, why have they chosen that route rather than to have these legitimate you know what you're so what you're describing why have they done that because people will say the reason that they have built this and they are defending is to push back against israel and the occupation what i call the occupation mm -hmm. by sure. israel. why is it that and not the um better scenario of which you're describing well I'll put it like this so that's a broken record that people keep playing over and over and over that they're fighting the occupation and occupation, occupation. Nobody's occupying the Gaza Strip since 2005, except for the Palestinians. Nobody. No foreign entity has power over them. They are completely independent to themselves since 2005. That's a fact. So, you know, the thing is, facts don't have feelings. You know, you probably heard that before. And that's just the bottom line. I mean, this is not an emotional plea. This is not, if you've noticed, I'm not hating on Palestinians. I, I hope people are at least hearing that in my tone, in my description. I don't have this, this uh, animosity towards the Palestinians. What I have is an absolute hatred for the industry of terrorism that the Palestinians have been fed by these terrorist entities who have taken control of the Gaza Strip. Those are the people I hate. They are scumbags. They are the lowest of low. They're worse than your 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 street thug. They are worse than any than any mafia organization that runs, you know, their mafia, uh, uh, you know, uh, organization anywhere in the world. They're worse than any of those guys, um, because what they are is it's like think about this: the mafia at least takes care of their own, yeah. It's, it's a, it, you know, if you're part of the mafia, then you benefit from the industry of bullying and stealing and intimidation and taking things that are not yours and, and making a profit off of and so on and so forth. What Hamas does is it creates a reality of, of hell, both for the supporters of Hamas and for those who don't support, you know, that they're just, they're, they're just the, you know, they're victims of that reality that they're, they're in. And, and, and then again, it's also against the people they're against, which is us, right? The state of Israel, the Jewish people. So 
for me, people need to understand that 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 Hamas is a horrible terrorist in this uh, a terrorist organization that has hijacked a whole their own population and have threatened the lives of the Israelis on the other side of the border, which you know between the Gaza the Gaza Strip, right? Um, Israel and Gaza. So I think it's important that. Yeah, that they realize that that is um, that's really what it's about. It's not about occupation. Israel doesn't occupy the Gaza Strip. The Gazans occupy their own area. You know what I'm saying? Like the, the Gazans or Hamas, etc., or the Palestinians. Nobody's controlling them. They're self-governed, and they're governed by Hamas. So what people need to do is they need to put the blame squarely on Hamas and stop blaming Israel. Israel doesn't has, we're not interested in the Gaza Strip and we haven't been interested in the Gaza Strip since 2005 and even now I don't think anybody in Israel cares for the Gaza Strip even after uh, the war with Gaza it's like we're happy for them to be happy in their own strip of land which we gave them and we gave up to them and said look we pulled out all our Jewish communities this strip is solely yours you know enjoy and uh, all we've reaped is terror ever since we made that decision to give them what is theirs, to give them, oh, give away the occupation, right? We don't occupy you anymore. There's no military presence here anymore. And uh, that has not benefited us. So I'm, I'm happy for people to prove to me where the occupation is because, you know, it's one thing to scream out occupation. It's another thing to prove it. So this is what I'm claiming. This is what I'm saying. Prove me wrong. Show me where there's an Israeli occupation in the Gaza Strip. You're saying that, you know, they've hijacked a generation of people. What then do you do? Because, of course, you can't, because that would then be genocide. Yeah. You know, you can't just be like, yep, well, yeah. you know, too late now. And do you agree that also this campaign now from Israel for the last four months that that can further radicalize people as well. That if you're a young Gazan who's been filled with propaganda, you're a 14 year old boy. Cause I know I'd be like this. If I was a 14 year old boy who had been raised like that. And then I see yeah. F 16s, F 15s dropping bombs. And of course the collateral damage from that has been huge as well. And then you guys as fully grown men coming in to my community, I, it's just going to radicalize me. That's not going to make me think Israel good guys. That's going to say to me, what this guy has been bloody filling me in with, with their green headband on is correct. That these guys do want to kill me and do want my way of life. So what do you do about that generation and the further radicalization? Isn't it just going to, isn't it just going to get worse? Yeah. And so that exactly that, that to me is my biggest concern being in Gaza. Um, personally, I didn't see any civilians, right? So, um, my unit is not necessarily a direct action unit. We're not supposed to to come in direct conflict with with or co direct combat with the enemy. Um, but yes, all the guys that that I know that we're fighting there, and they're engaging with the enemy, they're coming in contact with civilians who see them, right, in full combat gear, and we're just engaging with an enemy right near where these civilians were. Um, that absolutely is a problem and it's something i'm aware of and i think that's part of the problem is that the person who's going to be talking about their trauma their hurt their pain uh that's that's a real one i'm not ignoring that and i think that that's something that shouldn't be ignored that is the reality of combat that is the reality i think for any mature war fighter you're you're fully aware of how this looks how this scenario looks to the person on the receiving end of your operation. Um, so we're completely aware of that. I think at the same time, many of them who have come in, in actual contact with our soldiers have uh, also seen we're not Hamas. You know, we've 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 fed their animals that have been that have been just uh, neglected. So they see the compassion of our soldiers taking care of the animals that are being neglected, taking care of of people that that, that look like they're in need. You know, you can tell they're thirsty. They haven't, you know. Uh, been in any access for water or whatever, either because they've been held out at where they're at and they didn't go to 
uh, to Rafiach where they were supposed to go. And again, a lot of times it's not necessarily their fault. They didn't choose to stay behind. They were held behind because of Hamas that kept them there in the in the in the battle space. Um, because essentially, before we go into operating an area, we clear the area of civilians. We let them know ahead of time. We call their cell phones directly. We send them text messages and we send in leaflets before we even going to operate in that area. So you do have scenarios that I've seen where you have civilians stuck in the battle space. And obviously then, therefore, they're not getting any of the food and aid that's going down to, uh, uh, the, 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 I guess you could say the refugee camps, right, the, the, that are temporarily housing people that have just now left their homes where, you know, where the military has been fighting. So they've seen our compassion. They've seen us protecting them even from the Hamas uh, 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 firing that's just firing and not even disregarding them like they don't exist. You know, so our soldiers have actually guarded and protected the civilians. And so unless it's a it's a, a personal one off encounter like that, the mass of what you're going to see as a Gazan is you're going to see that the IDF came in. They shot the crap out of everything. They bombed the crap out of everything. And now my home is ruined. And that's a fact. And I'm aware of that. That is an absolute fact. There's no question about it. The way we're leaving Gaza, it's going to take them maybe 50 plus years to rebuild what we had to destroy because the terrorists have used, like I said, every faction of life that is in there for the the, the, the industry of terrorism. And um, the only way that I think that there's a hope for the for the Palestinians in Gaza to be able to recognize that this destruction has come on them is because of Hamas is that they're going to have to be smart enough to recognize that we weren't going to come unless you took our hostages. We weren't going to come in here and invade unless you pose a threat to our society, throwing rockets into our, our uh, cities and our towns and so on and so forth. So in other words, we're here because of you, you know, if you were a peaceful neighbor and a quiet neighbor and you just, you know, st stuck to your own business, in fact, more so, uh, we're even going to help you build whatever it is you want to build. And I'll give you one example of uh, something I think many people are not even aware about. So we know that in Gaza, you have more hospitals per capita than you do uh, have serving the same number of population here in Israel, right? So even the hospitals. And the, 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 the Shifa hospital, for example, being one of the major ones that have been mentioned in the media, I don't know if people know this, but it's our hospital planners, our doctors, heads of hospitals here in Israel that plan that hospital together with the Gazan um, uh, 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 medical staff and, and doctors to build that hospital. So even, even the building of their own hospitals has been done with 100% cooperation with Israeli medical professionals. And from speaking to one of the heads of the hospitals here in Israel uh, that, that conveyed that information, they said, yeah, and, and a lot of them come here and get medical treatments here in Israel. And on top of that, they said, you know, their doctors would be on daily communication through emails or phone calls daily up until October 7th. After October 7th, those doctors stop communicating with the Israeli staff here in Israel, with the Israeli hospitals. Um, and so I think what, what I'm trying to say is, we are the ones who want to have a peaceful coexistence. We're the ones who are willing to, to even assist and help our so-called enemy, because they see themselves as the enemy of us, we don't see them as our enemy. We say, see them as human beings like any other human being and that they have a right to, uh, 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 you know, to exist, self-determination, you name it. But not, not when, 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 when that side is constantly uh, uh, gravitating towards terrorism, the murder and, and, and killing wholesale of the Jewish population every time they get a chance to. And so, as you can imagine, that breaks down the trust between Israelis and the Gazans and the Palestinians uh, in general. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, really the only hope that I see personally, and this is something that I've, uh, I think I've done on maybe one or two interviews before discussing this publicly. Um, I personally believe that the only hope for the Gazans is for Christian missionaries to missionize them. And I know that sounds very radical because you're saying, wait, you you don't want these Muslims to, to, to like, what, convert to Christianity? Well, it wouldn't be a bad idea because I'll give you an example. You have the son of one of the founders of Hamas, Musa Hassan Yusuf, okay? He's been visiting here in Israel. He's seen, you know, the horrors of the terrorist uh, attacks on the on October 7th. And, and he's openly spoken against the evil that Hamas has brought to the world, which his own father was one of the founders of, of the organization. He himself had an encounter with a tourist from, I think, England, some Christian woman from England that was visiting the Holy Land, and she handed him a tract, and he read the tract, and he examined his own life, he examined where his ideals that he was brought up on and the Islamic radical jihadist teaching he was brought up on, how that was leading to the murder and killing of his own people. In other words, Hamas were killing Fatah and Fatah were killing Islamic Jihad, Islamic Jihad. Like they're all killing each other and we're killing and trying to destroy Israel. Like in other words, this is just a cycle of violence and evil. And he was sick of it. He got fed up with that. And he saw that what the gospel had to offer him from the Christian world was a message of hope, of peace, of turning the other cheek, right, of, of loving your neighbor. Basically, a completely different worldview that he embraced. And when I look at him, I see him as a fruit of hope and a future for, for, for the Palestinians living here. Because otherwise... If they keep getting this radicalized Islamic teaching that they are being bred up on and taught, it's just going to lead to another cycle of what we're having right now. If you have many more Musab Hassan Yusufs who either convert to Christianity and, and start acting way different than they've been acting and living way different than they've been acting towards their neighbor Israel, there's really no hope for them. And then the other thing is, Okay, let's say not Christian evangelism, right? Then at bare minimum, there has to be a radical change in the educational system from childhood and up to adulthood. If the children stop getting fed demonic, anti-Semitic hatred towards the other, specifically the Jews, um, which they deem the Zionists, like we're all Zionists here. You know, anybody living in Israel is a Zionist, right? Even though <laughs> within Israel, we're... Zionist and not so pro-Zionist, right? Even, you know, within our own culture, but in their minds, every Jew is a Zionist that lives here in Israel. And that's the enemy, right? We took their land, the Zionist, the anti, you know, it's like, so, so anti-Zion actually equals anti-Jewish, which is basically anti-Semitic. And it's a vehement, murderous agenda that they're being taught. They're not taught even the slightest respect towards the other, or that Maybe there's some Jews over there that we can have a dialogue with. Whereas I believe on the Gazan side and in Judea, Samaria, we have uh, Palestinians. I know for a fact that there are many Palestinians who we can have a dialogue with, but they're being shut down and they're not going to be open about their their uh, views because of being controlled and, 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 and under a terrorist regime, uh, 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 essentially. And I think that's important for people to understand. If you want to free Palestine, you have to free it not from Israeli intervention, because this is what it is. We're intervening with an enemy. It's free them from the terrorist agenda that is destroying the Gazans or the Palestinians, for this fact, in Judea, Samaria as well, in Ramallah, in Shechem, in, in, in Hebron. We have big enclaves of Palestinian cities. They're destroying themselves from, from the from the inside with their uh, destructive agenda that they're being uh, it's just being pumped in wholesale. Unfortunately, so you, you don't think that giving you know these people opportunity and hope. You know, I'm, I'm meaning young people. I'm not meaning you know these indoctrinated you know guys that are you know because there is a such thing as too far gone once once you're indoctrinated into yeah. Hamas. 
Uh, and you know that is the same with the you know, radical jihad we see with these other unit, these other groups around the world. But you don't think that you know having opportunity, having hope, you know, ability to you know flourish in the environment, because of course Gaza was not the sort of environment you can do that. You know, it, it's many will describe it as an open air prison. Like what real future? lay there with all the money getting i'm not saying yeah, i agree that yet yeah, billions yeah. And billions are getting pumped in but if these if the terror cells are just taking it well it doesn't really matter how much money's there it's not going towards the the kids education or whatever um correct you don't think that 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 would you know trump having a christian missionary because like personally uh and i've, I've spoken to this a bit before i'm i'm not religious and i i don't see um that you know, pumping more religion in there is actually going to help things personally. I, that's just the way <laughs> right, right. I think. Sure. Um, but you don't think that, you know, a different approach once the operation has ended, I guess, to cut the head off the snake of Hamas, or are you saying that, that cutting the head off the snake of Hamas is impossible for a generation or more? This was my concern too with this operation was, yeah. are you ever going to actually be able to succeed in this? You know, we spent 20 years in Afghanistan yeah. trying to do this, to the Taliban and, and other networks in there, and they're larger when we left than when we arrived. Uh, what do you think about, you know, maybe different ways to then, you know, a mission, and is it actually possible to defeat this? Yeah. So, I mean, that is, that's definitely my concern because I personally don't want to have to go back to Gaza and fight again. Uh, the same goes for any one of the guys in my unit. None of us take any pleasure in seeing the destruction of their homes, of their lives, um, and not to mention us being under the you know imminent threat to our lives when we go in and operate. So that's not something that we seek. We don't definitely don't seek war. Um, but what I will say is that when it when when my family and 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 our lives are under imminent threat, then I will rise up to the occasion because I have been training throughout the year, uh, throughout the year before that and the year before that and the year before that to be the top warrior that I can be, that when and the occasion rises, I'm ready to go foot, you know, toe to toe with whatever enemy is facing the, the, the Jewish people. And like we've claimed and have said many times, um, never again. So what happened in the Holocaust? I'm not going to let that happen again. I'm not going to let my people get trampled on ever again. I don't care who the enemy is. I don't care what the religious agenda is or, or, or genre or, or whatever. If it's, if it's, if it's Nazism, if it's whatever isms, you're going to have to face me, you know, and, 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 and fellow warriors like me. If we don't have to do that, we are more than happy to sit down and have a cup, you know, have a cup of coffee or sit down and have a, a beer on the beach and enjoy life. You know, that's 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 our reality. That's how we live our lives. You know, we're happy to to live and let live and let live. Um, unfortunately, as we're discussing here, the, the 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 future and hope for the Gazans is not so simple. <laughs> you know, um, unfortunately, they've been hijacked, like I've been saying, by an agenda, and. In my opinion, the only way that I can completely rid the Gazans from that demonic agenda, because it's not even, there's nothing natural about what you're seeing from these terrorists. They're so, they're so successful at, 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 at pumping people with hate. It's like that, that you become, they become like a zombie in a way that, that doesn't, that has no value for life, not their own, not for others. No future, no hope, and it's it. That's messed up. That's not human, you know. Normal human hu human behavior, right? Is food, shelter, right? You know, taking care of of your tribe, so to speak. Here, it, there's nothing natural about it, and the only way to to defeat it, in my opinion, is to bring down a very heavy hammer, so to speak of 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 uh of the military operations that we're doing to hit Hamas so hard that they're never going to recover and to really uh 
continue until until every Hamas terrorist is eliminated, and and we have to be ruthless about it. Unfortunately, we have to be ruthless about it, and we have to go all the way in, like all the way in, right? Just like you know, you're all in, you're all in. There's no like, okay, we took out number three, number two, we're good. No, take out number one, two, three, four, and all the way to number forty on the list of leadership. I don't care. You take them all out. They all have to be either arrested or eliminated in combat. They have to be utterly defeated because that's the only language these people understand, unfortunately, is violence. And so we have to be the ones who unfortunately execute that hard hand of violence that eliminates their, you know, their Michael Jordan, right? Their, you know, whoever their, 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 you know, their, that they idolize these, these terrorists and show them this guy is not a Michael Jordan, okay? He sucks, <laughs> you know? We eliminated him. We took him out. We're better than him, right? And so I think in a way, that's one way is to to show them that that basically the agenda and what they have been fed since childhood is a falsity because that's a fact. They can't truly defeat defeat Israel except for the way they're doing it on social media through playing the victim while being this this demon that goes and rapes and murders people, but then turns around and says, uh, you know, genocide, genocide, they're genociding me. No, no, you're the one that committed genocide, and it's the military, the IDF that's going in and stopping you. So, so yeah, we have to eliminate them in a, in a military fashion once and for all. And then hopefully the, these kids that grew up with these idolizing these heroes, so-called, will see that that was a false narrative. And like I said, and until they're also given something counter, something that is not revolving around more of that agenda, uh, you know, okay, so Michael Jordan failed us. We got Kobe Bryant, you know, Kobe Bryant is going to get us to the, you know, he's going to help us win now, right? It has to be where there isn't that other option, right, uh, that leads back to the same cycle of, of violence. But it, there has to be a way where we can give him hope through another agenda. And that agenda is, like I said, the open air prison, you know, this open air prison with the amount of money that's been uh, invested into the Gaza Strip could have been one of the leading uh, economies in the world, in tourism, in, in, in whatever they put their minds to other than terrorism. Because there's tons of potential in the Gaza Strip as far as where they're located, they could have had an international airport, and there was one up until uh, the Second Antifada. There was an airport in the Gaza Strip. Uh, just to remind people, they weren't completely landlocked. And Israel will not allow them to be completely landlocked if, the, you know, if they're, they're, they're a neighbor that we're not concerned that their planes are going to go and, and, and crash land into Israel, right? So if we know that they're going to have a, a real... Uh, uh, airline, right? Company, just like we have, Elal. They have whatever they want to call it. And they can have flights to whichever countries that are going to also have to trust, because you're going to have to learn the trust that, hey, this airline's not going to, you know, crash into our country, right? Into, uh, you know, England or Germany or where have you, right? Like, in other words, they have to build trust. And they definitely had enough money to build an industry that the industry could prove itself to be trustworthy by flying to first, you know, other locations, right, other than Europe, where people will be really concerned about a Palestinian airline flying in here. And when you build that trust of like, look, they, they've, they've made X amount of flights to X, you know, locations, successful flights, they have customer service, they have such and such, you know, things that you have money to do, right? Just put your mind towards anything other than terrorism, and they had all the opportunity in the world. They could have had the best beachfront hotels in the world on the Mediterranean, right? But instead, it's gone to uh, utter destruction. And that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's the bottom line, is they had every opportunity in the world, and they blew it. And, I, and, and my opinion is this, like, hopefully, through Hamas proving themselves to be untrustworthy in the eyes of the Palestinians. And hopefully they're going to love 
and, 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 you know, have a love for their lives and a future for their children more than they support these terrorists, hopefully, and that their hatred towards us becomes less and that their hatred towards the terrorists that led them to this destruction becomes more. Because unless you really hate these guys that led you down this path of destruction, unfortunately, they're going to keep supporting the next uh, terrorist leader and they'll call it something else. They'll relabel it and they'll, uh, they'll make other mugs, you know, and hand them out and candies and support more of that stupid agenda. That's just, again, leading you back into a spiral of destruction. Um, I mean, honestly, this is a real tough question and it really bothers me because uh, I think it's very sad. Like they're destroying the lives of millions of people uh, and unfortunately, what even are, what I find to be even more frustrating is there's people on the streets protesting in favor of these terrorists. That's what boggles my mind. How can you protest in favor of these terrorists after October 7th? Not before. Before I could understand, okay, sure, whatever. But after October 7th, it, I don't understand these people. I, I have zero understanding of these people. I don't, I can't, I can't get into their minds. But uh, you can it boggles my mind. Though, I think, I think, I think a lot of people, I know a lot of people who go and do these, you know, uh, protests, say in Australia, say in the main street down here. I, I think yeah. there's, uh, they're ill informed about what is what. Are you saying when someone marches down the street with a free Palestine flag that they're supporting the terrorists or the, or with a Hamas flag? Because we see that as well. We do see on the street here and we've seen in yeah. London and it is sickening. We see we see a Taliban flag. You see Hezbollah. We see Hamas. We, whatever bloody ones you want to bring up, we see. And that is, there is no sympathy for that. But I think, can you see that if you are a university student here and what you're seeing on the TV is a very powerful military leveling its small neighbor. And you're seeing yeah. this hor horrible footage of what is happening to children there and civilians there as well, that they are then, you know, this idea that, well, what the fuck is going on here? That the, this is evil. What is happening? I can understand yeah. the whole mindset for free Palestine. Um, can you see that there, there may be just a, an ill-informed message there? Cause I actually think most people, have uh ethically i think are in the correct spot but i think where they're informed is incorrect if that makes sense like i've i've said publicly yeah. i'm the biggest free palestine supporter that there is but it needs to be annexed with free palestine of hamas that if if someone marches on that then i am i'm behind that the whole way um but can, can do you can you see that there there may be a difference there or do you do you just put it all in the same Ask it. So to me, it's it, there is a difference for sure. Um, there is a difference, and I think the the majority of people who are are chanting free Palestine are ill informed of what you know what what it is they're wanting to to free, uh, and the majority of them don't even know where Palestine is mm. geographically. Yeah, they 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 don't they're they're so ill informed they don't even know what it is they're they're, they're just What's the river, protesting river to the sea, and you ask them where where to where, and oh yeah, which river, which sea, yeah, well, somewhere up in Lebanon, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so I get I get that what they're protesting against is military aggression towards towards uh, uh, civilians. I get that. I get those people, and I understand those people. What what I'm saying is at the same time though too is I don't understand you. In other words, I don't have, I have zero respect for you that in this day and age with the internet, with access to information, that you're not going to dig, dig any deeper than just that first footage that you see and immediately pick a side. I'll give you an example. Um, we just lived through the uh, Ukraine-Russia war, right? And it's still ongoing. But, you know, just before this war, we had that happening in the world, right? I didn't go take a public stance and go protesting on the streets against Russia and say, 
they're bad and what they did is bad and this is so bad and 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 and, and make all these anti-war protests because to be honest i had no clue why is this one fighting this one what's the what's the you know because i know from like fighting here and other and, and just studying wars in general there isn't a a good guy and bad guy clean cut every time right um and it's very difficult because of propaganda and because of the way media spin things and people with agendas spin things that you don't get a full picture of really what this is all about. Unless I really understand what this war is about, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. That's exactly what I did. Okay. And I'm talking to somebody who has Russian friends, Ukrainian friends, and I've, and I've asked them to explain to me what this conflict is about. And from hearing all these different sides, I'm like, okay, it's freaking complicated. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not so clean cut. So I'm keeping my mouth shut because there's nothing for me to protest here. What I am against is innocent people being murdered on either side of this conflict, right? So, but I'm not going to protest about it because like, you know what I mean? Because when you make a protest, you're picking a side here and there's no, there's no winning side. Russian civilians dying, Ukrainian civilian civilians dying is bad. Russian soldiers or Ukrainian soldiers dying for a cause that neither one of them want to die for, that sucks. That's not cool, right? So I can I can empathize with both of, of all these sides, and I'm not going to run to the streets with a flag of either one. You're not going to see on my social media page any uh, uh, Ukraine, you know, uh, the, the yellow-blue that became it just became like wildfire everybody had to have that on their thing you know uh all these social media um apps you would see it in the app if you if you recall right like they would they would make the app color if let's say the app used to be green then they would have half blue half yellow like in support of ukraine you get what i mean it just became like the popular thing to do and I'm just saying, I know as an example for myself, I didn't pick a side here. I didn't promote one over the other. I understood that there's a conflict going on here and I don't fully understand it. I don't know the history really. I have educated myself on it. I'm still not gonna make a public stance about it, right? Um, what, I, what I would promote is that if there's somebody who can mediate between the two and help put an end to the war i'm all for that let's let's go to talks let's but this is not the same with the gazans with the palestinians and israel conflict there's nothing to mediate here one side wants the full annihilation and destruction of one people period end of story and that's a different reality and what i'm saying is when you're standing in protest for the side that is claiming that openly and you can't educate yourself enough to understand what is it that they want to free from what occupation? And wh well, what is it? Do, do they want then? Right? Cause I'll be asking the Ukrainians, what do you guys want then? And when I look into it, I'm like, okay, I understand the legitimacy between, between behind your claim. What is it that Russia wants? Okay. I understand the legitimacy between, behind your claim. So there is something that, you know what I'm saying? You can have these two come and have a media area that's going to hopefully help resolve those issues right but when russia says we want all of ukraine annihilated all of it gone no ukrainians there period right well there's obviously nothing to negotiate then is there right but that's not the case so you get what i mean so like let's just take that conflict there's something that you can resolve here you take this conflict there's nothing to resolve here one side wants the complete annihilation of Israel, period, always, all the time. And that's something that's very troubling to me. And um, it's like, how do you solve that problem? You know what I mean? But yet there are people that are going to go out there and protest for something like this that is clearly very, there's something very messed up here if you dig deep enough. And you're not even taking the time to dig deep enough. You're just jumping on your emotions because you saw a picture of a young child being pulled out of rubble. What you don't realize is half of those pictures are are not even from the Gaza war. They're from the war in Syria and, and kids being pulled out of 
you know, wreckages from, 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 you know, a, a whole other country or, or an earthquake that happened in Turkey. I mean, like you have all of that mixed into what's getting into people's feeds and then you're jumping on emotion and it's like, bro, like be a little bit more careful between, uh, cause, cause we're talking about life or death situations here. Like this is a life or death realities that, that, that this conflict's about. It's not just pick your team. You know, I don't pick pro-Israel team versus pro-Palestine. I'm pro-Israel as an Israeli. I'm a patriot, but I'm also pro the Palestinians having a future for them as well. Being pro-Israel doesn't mean being anti-Palestinian. You know, I want to be pro for them as well. And Israel is that. The state of Israel is the people of Israel. You ask anybody on the streets and you've been here. How many Israelis have you interviewed and have they said that they want to kill all the Palestinians? Do you have one person that you interviewed that said that? Well, look, I will say I had people very angry at Palestinians, but I will also say I was there. I was there at a yeah. very high time as well. You know, I was in the days following the October 7th uh, massacre. And I will yes. say, you know, what is said following something like that for the couple of weeks, you know, I think you need to take in emotional aspect too, rather than if they actually mean it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. So in that I, worst yeah. case scenario, how many, how many did you actually run into that literally said, uh, just kill one, them all and nail it one, all? One, but he was a very young lad whose sister was currently a hostage. Um, one. If you, one. if you captured you, my yeah. sibling, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'd have no sympathy anywhere. Um, exactly. And I, I think, I think you touch on some important stuff. Like, yeah, look, the footage coming out of there of, you know, kids being pulled out of rubble and stuff, it is, it is horrible. There is still a hell of a yes. lot of it. And I do think it's important for people to stand up um, when they do think there is times of injustice. But like you said, I think the basic educating yourself about something is very important. And I think the main tool that I see in this is this, um, like the queers for Palestine, the LGBT for Palestine. And I'm like, I I this just yeah. shows me, I have no problem with, with either of you in this, but it does sure. show me that you, you have not looked at all at what is happening there because it just shows me off the bat of, well, I'm not going to talk to you because this is going to be nonsense. Because if you understood yeah. the most simple thing, you would say, no, that is not allowed. And I've explained to people, if I went to anywhere that I have been within Israel and I addressed in whatever I wanted and said, no, one, nothing is actually going to happen. Some people, you know, some, some rabbi might look at me like, who's this idiot? But that's going to be about the extent of it. That, that's it. Right. Where you cross that board or fence and you are like that. Well, you're, it, you, there's going to probably be very grave consequence of this. Same as the ceasefire, the ceasefire now. And I yeah. can absolutely see the reason for people calling for ceasefire. But the ceasefire needs to come with freeing the hostages. That Israel has clearly right. put out that, there, yeah, it takes two to tango. At least the hostages will discuss the ceasefire. And that, right. that had, had not occurred. Um, so I, 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 I understand you, but I think, yeah, there is times of injustice. I think people need to be outspoken, but you also need to have some basic level of what you are speaking about, um, at least at the very bare minimum. And it can be very difficult. It's like, say with Ukraine and is, uh, my God, not Ukraine, Israel, Ukraine and Russia, I'd say I'm fairly versed yeah. in that. And even then, the more I find out, the more confusing that actually becomes. And I think that this conflict in Israel and Gaza is significantly more uh, complex, complex than that, again, as there is even further uh, religious discussion in it too. Radicalization is very, very difficult to get your head around as well in this. You only need to look down the rabbit hole a little bit of some of this, and it's like, it, it's mind-boggling. But what, what do you make yeah. when people are claiming that it's not uh, Palestine, it's not Gaza that committed genocide that it was israel that is currently committing genocide in gaza what do you make yeah. when you see that up through the international courts social medias yeah. countries what do you make of that again it the way i see it very clean cut is that it is an anti-semitic um one-sided hatred towards the jewish people Hatred towards our success as a young nation from nothing 
to creating one of the, the, the strongest economies in the world, technologies, et cetera. Like we've been very successful since 1948 as a nation and as a people. And by the way, that includes, and I think that's important for people to recognize what I'm talking about here. It's not just a Jewish state. We have uh, minorities who live here in peace that have never had peace throughout their whole existence as a minority in the Middle East. So under Israel, many of these minorities benefit from the state of Israel and from peace that they've never seen before the state of Israel was 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 established in 48. Um, so so basically Israel's success, I think, really pisses off a lot of people in the world that that clearly still have an anti-Semitic view of the Jewish people. And unfortunately, the ones that get they get clumped into that is like I said, are also those minorities that live here, including Muslims, by the way, Bedouins and, and so on that we have here um, who are part of the fabric of the society of Israel. Um, so yeah, to, to claim that Israel's committing genocide when clearly on October 7th, that was the, and, and this is just to put things in proportion. October 7th was the worst attack on Jews since the Holocaust. And that's not an overstatement at all. It's not an ex exaggeration at all. Um, we've had many wars. We've had many pogroms throughout the, 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 the nation of Israel throughout history. But the worst attack on Jews since the Holocaust was October 7th. That's a fact. Uh, I'm not the only one saying this. Uh, many Israelis are feeling that. And what I'm saying is that in light of that worst attack on Jewish people in the world, historically that now is when the world has feels it's a right to stand on their on their on their pedestal and preach righteousness to us and justice to us like now's the time you chose to do this beforehand israel wasn't committing genocides beforehand you know and and they were accusing that as well right any operation that we carried out it, you know historically there's always this claim that we're being excessive and to me again statements like that are only they're not based in reality okay because the the excessiveness of the israeli military is nowhere near the excessiveness of the u.s military united nations militaries okay and forces um australia canada okay any military operations that any of these so-called righteous nations in the eyes of the world agenda and world uh, standard, the missions that you guys carry out around the world globally against terror, against whatever threatens your countries, we execute a higher moral standard than any military in the world. That's a fact, okay? So to say that Israel is excessive, well, then look in the mirror first. And point the finger at yourself first and say, if Israel is excessive, then what were we during the war in Afghanistan and Iraq? What were we in the war with Iran, you know, fighting in Iran or fighting in, 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 uh, in, in Africa or in South America or fighting in Russia now and in Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so if we're excessive, then what are those? So what is it that how dirty is the hands of the world is what I'm saying? So the armies of the world are no more righteous than we are. In fact, on paper, we operate in a much more higher moral standard than any other, any other military in the world. And that's something that we pride ourselves in. And it's not just because we're trying to be better than the other and because of these claims against us or whatever. We're not trying to prove anything to anyone else. It's based off of the Jewish principles of war ethics. And it's actually something that bothers a lot of secular Jews who don't believe in those ethics of war, right? They're like, well, I don't believe in God or I don't believe in, you know, some ethical standard that you're wanting to hold me to. And so every soldier in the military actually has to hold themselves to that ethical moral standard that's based off of the the, the Jewish Jewish ethics uh, in Torah. 
And I think that's something important for people to understand that if that bothers you, then 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 there's no military in the world that's going to fight a much more ethical uh, war with their with their with their enemy than than what we fight. And um, so then you should put yourself first on that pedestal of who you want to condemn before you put us on that pedestal. And if you don't find it to be a troubling issue that now of all times that when the Jewish people are the most down, the most hurt, the most uh, uh, attacked in the most horrible way in our history, that now is when you choose to, to go to the streets and protest. If that doesn't bother you, then I find that to be extremely troubling. You know, people need to really, really think long and hard on what exactly is it that you find that we're doing that's wrong? What exactly is it? You know, so, so okay, so it's the claims that Hamas is saying, right? The, 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 the health, uh, was it the, 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 the health ministry, whatever it's called, uh, that's actually run by Hamas. So, so you're, you're, you're taking numbers, inflated numbers, of casualties of this war from Hamas, a terrorist organization, and then you're running to the streets and claiming genocide. You're claiming excessive force based off of the report of a terrorist organization that carried out a horrible attack on the 7th of October. Let that sink in. Like, get your information from a better source, first of all. Second of all, remember that if there are any civilian casualties, which there are, that's because of Hamas again, because Hamas takes civilians, forces them into the war zone where the battle space is, where Israel is trying to usher the civilians out into the safe area. And if there's casualties in that battle space, it's not because of Israel. It's again because of Hamas. Do you believe he's so, doing enough to... Yeah to minimize and reduce civilian casualties? Do you think more could be done or more yeah. could have been done? There's no more that could be done, honestly. Uh, it's actually excessive. Like we've, 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 uh, <laughs> like put it like this. A lot of the, a lot, okay. So daily there's, there's food, there's water. There is supplies, building supplies, and you name it, going and being trucked into the Gaza Strip, okay? The ones who are hijacking a lot of those supplies are the terrorist groups. They hijack these trucks, just like if anybody's seen Black Hawk Down, and you see the, the terrorists taking those trucks and shooting everybody that's trying to get near the rice and, and, and what have you. So picture that scenario, and picture the good guys American forces going in and going after Hadid and all these other bad guys to stop the people, to stop the bad guys from getting the food and the supplies and letting it stream to towards the people who are starving, right? That's what we're doing. We're not just we're not just protecting the civilians from getting the supplies, we're providing the supplies itself. So Israel's both providing the supplies and it gets in the terrorist hands. We do our best to try to 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 counter the, the the terrorists who are taking the supplies, but you can only do so much. And um, like, could we do more? I mean, it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, imagine if you bent over backwards as a country, and you're asking me, can you bend over backwards some more? It, it's it's like, <laughs> I mean, honestly, like, look. I wish we could do more, and I know that if Israel could do more, we would. Um, so I think we're doing the maximum that we can. And um, I think, like, again, what, what the world needs to understand is that there's only so much you can do when an area is controlled by a terrorist entity that's just destroying this whole area. Um, and again, the, the buck stops with them. It's not with us. We're doing everything we can to avoid civilian, civilian casualties. We're doing everything we can to provide food and water and supplies and medical for those civilians. While at the same time, 134 of our hostages are not even getting their medical supplies for those who have medical prescriptions from, for, for, for prescriptive drugs that they need. Yeah. 
And we've actually proven that just recently, the military has, has um, uh, uh, advertised the, 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 that we got to the location where all of this medical supplies was supposed to go to by name per the prescription of the hostage. And it's just sitting there in a pile collecting dust. So imagine that. It's like you're supplying and taking care both medically and, and, and food and shelter and everything for the enemy so-called that you're fighting while your own hostages are being malnutrition. They're not getting medical supply. The Red Cross isn't even batting an eyelash at. Where's, where's the public outcry against the, the Red Cross? Hello? Anybody? You guys fund it. You give money to the Red Cross. I know you do. If you live in Europe, you know, anybody who has a heart and wants to help in world crises around the world has, has given money to the Red Cross, is what I'm saying. And imagine this entity is doing nothing to help the Jewish uh, uh, um, uh, hostages. And that's why I say, to me, it's a simple highlight of an anti-Semitic sentiment that unfortunately is still persistent in the world. How else can you explain it? This one-sidedness, accusing the victim, that's Israel, of being the, 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 uh, the one who committed the atrocities. We're the victim. And the victim happens to also have a very strong big brother who's going to defend you, right? So that just ho so happens to be the case. So because the big brother is stepping in, defending the victim doesn't mean that the victim is not a victim anymore. It just so happens to be the victim has a protector that's protecting it. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and I hope people that are listening to this get that and understand that. I'm Again, I'm not looking for hurting any Gazans, any Palestinians. As much as they hate me, I don't hate them. The only ones, like I've made clear, that I personally have a, an actual hatred towards, it's the terrorist um, heads who are benefiting monetarily and, and living in Europe, living in Qatar, living in all these uh, high-end fancy hotels. They're with prostitutes and they're doing drugs and they're living it up while the Gazans, who they're making the money off of through their suffering, right? Money comes more into the terrorist uh, uh, bank and they're literally profiting from the hurt of their own people, from the destruction of Gaza. While they're outside of Gaza, living it up in a most disgusting way. To me, those are absolute scumbags, and they need to be eliminated. And they need people like us to stand up against and to, you know, hold them to justice. Those guys need to be loathed. Um, and the Gazans, in my opinion, are the victims of that, of this entity of of of, of destruction. That uh, that's what people need to be protesting. Free. Gaza from Hamas, free Gaza from. Uh, uh, <laughs> you need to go to the European uh, Union and to all of these entities, the United States, U.S. aid. Okay, there's you'll see plaques all over uh, 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 the West Bank and and Gaza where you see U.S. aid funded project for this square, this school, or this that. You guys need to be going over there and protesting and saying, why is our money going to fund terrorists? Why isn't there an accountability towards the billions that have been poured into um, this small population of the world? You know, and again, just do the math, friends. Look at what I just pointed out. I gave people a very important piece of information. The Marshall Plan. Google it. Look at how much money went into the Marshall Plan and then look into what I just pointed out that five times the amount of that money and, 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 and you know, five times that money went into the Palestinian Authority through the hands of these terrorists. And what have they done with it? And how come you're not holding them accountable for that? On the other hand, Israel has not received anything like that. And yet people are crying and protesting and saying, stop sending funding to Israel. The funding that goes into Israel is in joint operations and projects that actually help benefit the United States with defense projects that they benefit from more than Israel does. So really, it's 
defense projects that they benefit from, and then their citizens go and protest and say that money needs to stop going to Israel. You know what? I agree with you. I don't. We don't need your money. We don't need your money. But then we can defend our. We can make our own defense projects, and we can benefit from them way more if we sell it ourselves instead of the U.S. benefiting from and getting and reaping all the benefits from that. That's the difference. We don't need outside help. We don't need outside money. We don't. You know, we've created. We have created a wonderful, successful, not perfect, because Israel's not perfect. Again, I'm not saying we're a perfect nation, but we've created a good ton of, 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 of good out of the little that we've had and from the nothing that we've had and out of wars that we have had to live through. And we're doing just fine. So really, what you need to do is stop sending money to these terrorist organizations. And there needs to be an accountability there needs to be an accountability to, towards these terrorist entities. And the world needs to start holding them accountable and stop blaming Israel. It's insane. We're a democracy. We have a democratic elected government and governing bodies in the state of Israel. We have Muslims. We have Druze. We have Charkasians. We have Bedouins. We have all these minority groups. Um, it's like, hello, <laughs> we give free, full opportunity for every citizen of the state of Israel, full benefits, for every citizen of the state of Israel, on the only exception of um, those living in the uh, in the territories that are still not fully uh, hasn't been decided if it's if it's for Israel or, or, or going over to the Palestinians. That's the only exception. And trust me, they still get a ton of benefits either way because our social system is very, uh, very generous. So, you know, again, we can we can do better. But again, when you come up with a great like, I want to accuse you. Well, first, let me ask you, well, what is it you're doing better and different than I am? Please show me how to do it better. You know, don't just critique us when you when, you know, what I'm saying when it's off of nothing, like show me a way that I'm doing wrong here. Show me a way that you're doing it better because I can prove to you that most of the people that where they're coming from, where you're coming from, isn't much better than what we're doing in your own country, right? You know, ideas that you're implementing, you know, freedoms and, and benefits or whatever. Show me how to do it better. I'd love to learn. Show me from yourself, first of all, you know. But uh, to stand on your on your soapbox when you have nothing to stand on, to me, is just ridiculous. Can you talk us through some of the operations of what you and your team were doing inside Gaza and how that how that looked? <laughs> um, a lot of what we do is classified, actually. Um, but what I can say is that uh, a lot of the operations that we have conducted, um, like the, I'll put it like this: the most important part of our operations, for me at least, is that what we have done is that we have helped provide um, medical evacuations and, and, and medical uh, stabilizing treatments for the soldiers that have been, uh, that have been wounded or killed in combat. And so part of our operations is to get the soldier from the front lines of the combat to get them stabilized, to get them ready for, um, either a heli through helicopter uh, evacuation out of the battle zone and or to get them through a vehicle transportation out of the battle zone outside the Gaza Strip to where they get uh, transferred to uh, the hospitals where they're going to get medically uh, treated and so on. So uh, for me, that's one of the most uh, important missions that we've gotten to do. Um and unfortunately, in some cases also, we also bring out uh, the, the fallen soldiers, those who have fallen in battle, um, and making sure they get to their family and they can, um, they can mourn their loss and so on. So for me, I find that to be a very holy uh, work, so to speak. Um, and then, of course, uh, also um, providing security for uh, the transportation of goods going into the Gaza Strip. 
Um, and a lot of that also going to the Palestinians, actually, you know, a lot of the supplies and so on. Um, so, yeah, we provide all kinds of different, uh, um, a bunch of different missions similar to that. Um, and then also some of our missions include also the assisting in the destruction of the terror tunnels. Um, so we've had, we've had that uh, privilege to be a part of that as well. Um, and I think it's important to people to understand is that, that, you know, the more we're able to destroy these tunnels, the more we're able to turn off the spigot, so to speak, for the terrorists. Because as long as they have those tunnels to operate out of, then over 80% of them are hiding actively now, hiding in those tunnels. They're hiding in those tunnels and they're using them to uh, attack the Israeli soldiers and to create more casualties on our end, but also to, to, to lengthen the, the, the time that we have to operate in the Gaza Strip. So every tunnel that you see published that's been publicized online, you know, they show pictures, the military uh, spokesperson, whatever body will publicize another terror tunnel destroyed. I think it's important that people understand the meaning behind that is that the time spent for our soldiers in the Gaza Strip is less because you get what I'm saying. The more tunnels are destroyed, then you're kind of you're pushing the enemy into a corner, so to speak. Yeah. And he's going to have no choice but to surface and surrender or fight and go down, you know, go down fighting. I mean, it's their choice, really. We um, have seen that Ukraine has had, you know, you know, fairly high casualties. And, you know, there's been even company commanders taken out. We see, of course, the the footage um, for things like the Al Quds network with Hamas as well targeting these soldiers. It seems like they have very still fairly good freedom of movement around yeah. areas in the Gaza Strip. And it does seem that, you know, Israel has taken casualties of which, you know, myself being a military man, see like a, you know, a company commander taken out. And I'm like, holy shit, like that's a, that's a big deal. Can you talk to, I guess, those yeah. casualties or the figures that we're getting out of Israel? Are they correct? Are they, you know, how, yeah. how complex is this environment to work in? Well, most of the stuff that you'll see from the terrorists that they publicize is a exaggeration of what happened. So, for example, you'll see them uh, come out of one of their terror tunnels and uh, shoot a, a, a rocket propelled grenade, an RPG, at one of the tanks. Mm -hmm. And then you'll notice the clip will cut at the explosion, right? Yeah. They don't show you the aftermath of, well, the tank basically <laughs> sustained the hit. And that, and that guy either got eliminated and or ran back into the tunnel and disappeared, right? End of story. So so a lot of what they put out is propaganda to help support, of course, their morale of like, look, we're doing really good. Like, keep doing what you're doing. Because I'm telling you what's for, what's for sure a fact is that they're getting sick and tired of living underground for so many months at a time, right? So that's why right now a ceasefire is not good. What they need, what we need to do is we need to keep eliminating more terror tunnels and um, putting the pressure and the heat on the terrorists, which is what we're doing. So I know that from the from the commanders that are fighting in the battle space, what I know is that we are putting the heat on. They are feeling it while at the same time, yes, we do have some very serious casualties on our end. We do have some uh, higher uh, rank officers that have been killed in the combat zone and that's just the reality of war that is what it is um and yeah it sucks uh and it and it's not just of course if one of those guys get taken out it's 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 harder on us than it, if it's a regular soldier to us every every human that's being killed in this war including uh the civilians from their end uh is 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 to us an absolute disaster okay um any terrorist that's taken out for me is a success. Um, just put that, you know, in, in that perspective. But any soldier of ours that's 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 uh, been killed in battle, any of their civilians that have been killed in, 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 in our operations, that is a bad day anytime. Um, but what I will say is that 
I, from what I can tell, the, 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 the mission success is growing on our end and the capabilities from the terrace is shrinking. And that's why um, there's this constant, uh, this constant fight for a ceasefire, so to speak, right? That there's this constant pressure on Israel for a ceasefire because the enemy knows we're closing in on them and they're feeling that heat. And it's like a caged animal, right? They're going to do whatever they can to survive. And what they know is that they can appeal to international pressure and they can appeal and say, look how much we've suffered. Look at Gaza, how bad it is. Yeah, but you're not up there, so you don't give a crap. It's all good. <laughs> and if it was your home that was destroyed and you're anywhere in the top or echelon of the terrorist uh, organization, well, you have a house in Dubai, you have a house over there, you have a house in the Caribbean, you know, like you're good to go, bro. Like you're not crying for any of your losses. And uh, so the sad reality is, is, is uh, the, the bigger, the big losers here at the end of the day are going to be the civilians on both ends. Our civilians are their losses to their home, to their family, etc. That's a big loss. Um, the soldiers who have fallen in battle, that's going to be a loss to that family. Um, but really, it's the, the, the normal guy on the street, so to speak, your normal Joe Schmo. Um, when this whole thing is, is over, um, they're going to go back to ruins. They're going to go back to nothing. And the winner out of this is going to be the terrorists, unless we eliminate them, unless we freeze their assets, right? They're going to be the winner. They're going to be the ones that are going to, they're going to live out this, 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 uh, this conflict and they're going to reap the benefits of it. So that's the sad reality of this, uh, the way I see it, you know. If Israel is successful in eliminating Hamas, do you think that Israel has the responsibility to rebuild, you know, what has been bombed in Gaza? Because I've seen photos of the north of Gaza and it's it looks like yeah. a quarry. Uh, do you think Israel, yeah. the, those partners who support Israel, say Australia and America or in the UK, do you think we have the responsibility to go, yep, we bombed this house because the terrorist network was under it, but the yeah. people who lived here are not terrorists. You know, you, you know. Right. Do you think Israel has a responsibility to to foot that? No, I don't think we have a responsibility. And I, to be honest, I don't think anybody needs to take responsibility to rebuild Gaza. The ones who have to be held accountable, and this is the ones that I keep putting the blame on, because that's really where the buck stops, is with Hamas and all the other terrorist entities that have created the situation. So take out of their bank accounts, and there's definitely no lack in their bank accounts. Like I pointed out, five times the amount of money that went into the Marshall Plan to rebuild all of Europe is what's gone into um, these terrorist entities. So they have plenty of money, plenty of money. And if the Arab world that is so concerned about the Palestinians, they say they are, they have plenty and plenty of, of, of money to support their Arab brothers in the Gaza Strip to rebuild Gaza. So the way I see it is you're the perpetrator. I'll put it like this. If a thief stole your car, right? A thief stole your car. It became his property now. And then you got the car back. So is is are you the one? Or the car got destroyed in the process of trying to get it back. Who's the one who's supposed to pay to get the car redeemed? The the person the car got stolen from or the thief who stole the car? Well, the thief. Like what would be morally correct here? The thief. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I I, I do, but but uh, what I, what I'm getting at is you know we've we've you know, theoretically you've eliminated Hamas, especially when the thief has the money, by the way, to pay back. Yeah, well, that's Ten what I'm, times, that's what I mean. You know, you know what I mean? That if, they're, if, like they're not yeah, down and out. Eliminated, there's people <laughs> who are living the high life in Saudi yeah. and whatever are eliminated. And, you know, okay, yeah. we've got half, we've got, we've got a few billion dollars to rebuild some stuff. But yeah, unlike the thief, the thief is not innocent. There are people living inside Gaza who, these women, children, there are people there that, you know, are completely innocent from fighting the war. They, Correct. for instance, Correct. There, there are people, they didn't cross the border on October the 7th. They're living in terror as well. 
you know, part of this operation was to go in and do that. And I think as well, say with Afghanistan, that we failed in our duty to protect people in Afghanistan that we threw under the bus as well. Yeah, if we bomb the mm-hmm. shit out of a, a Taliban network, fucking happy days. But if in doing that, then we've destroyed the livelihood and houses of people who are just around that, I believe that we have the responsibility to build that, to, you know, to have some influence sure. on that, same as we had the influence, we had the um, responsibility to pull out the interpreters and those people that we left for dead and worked for and worked with their turn. I think we failed at right. that. And I, I think that there is some responsibility personally, and I, you know, it's not going to be me doing it. And this is why I've asked you here because I'm willing to <laughs> open yeah, to, I'm, yeah. I'm honestly open to talk to anyone. Um, yeah. yeah. I just think that, yeah, what has happened in the North as far as the bombing campaign has been exceptionally savage um whether it has been successful or not i guess that's something up for debate if the missiles you know have stopped but um yeah yeah, for those people that just were going about their daily life but yeah it's it's a hard situation man it's 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 um it's something that i'm glad and every time i come back to australia whether it's in ukraine or whether it's in israel or turkey and syria wherever I'm fucking glad Australia doesn't have neighbors. <laughs> we've got, we've got New Zealand. <laughs> uh, legitimately, man, I, I fly for the 16 yeah. hours across, you know, I come from, I typically go through Dubai or uh, Doha and I fly for that yeah. oh, 12 to 15 hours. And I'm like, thank fuck. This is all ocean. I don't want, I don't want a neighbor. <laughs> um, and New you Zealand. You only have yourselves to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Aussies, mate, fucking sometimes we do have to worry about it. But mate, yeah. look, is there anything you you would like to cover that we haven't covered in this interview so far before we wrap up? Yeah. Um, well, the thing, the, just to kind of uh, counter what you were saying, the, the contrast and difference between Afghanistan or Iraq is that um, you do not have foreign entities that have already pumped billions of dollars into those countries. And that's what I'm getting at is yeah. is the reason why I think Israel doesn't have a responsibility is because they can afford to rebuild is what I'm saying. Yeah. They have more than enough money to rebuild. And, 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 and to me, the best way to hold the perpetrator accountable is not to punish Israel's economy because we're already being punished by me being in reserve duty for over four months, myself and, you know, the tens of thousands of other uh, soldiers who have been, uh, out of our economy. So our economy is already hurt. Um, we have a lot to rebuild from all the destruction they've caused us and so on and so on and so forth, right? And, and not, to man- not to mention to manage this war and to fund it and so on to defend ourselves. So, so we're already financially been hit. So what I'm saying is uh, to be fair, it's the terrorists that should pay for the destruction that they caused and they have more than enough uh, to to pay for the damages, um, so that's what I'm saying. And in, 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 to me, I think it's it's different, and it's there's there's it's nice to compare the two, because there are, there are there are things that you can learn from from both these sides uh, of, of conflicts and, and and wars and the way you fought them and and the way we're fighting. For sure, there's lots to be learned from that. Um, but I think it's also to understand all, and also to be able to see the differences between these two conflicts or any conflict really that's happening in the world like i brought ukraine and in russia and threw that under the bus so to speak in this conversation um because i think there's there are things that we can see and 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 and, and what have you in parallels um i think one thing that that rarely gets talked about and is an also an important fact that people need to understand that what was planned on october 7th was a way worse plan in the planning than what actually got executed. Yes. Um, I, I haven't seen this in the media. I haven't seen anybody really talk about it. But based on the intel that we gleaned from the terrorists and, and through uh, interrogating the ones that came into our hands, what we discovered is that the terrorists, uh, their big plan, like their end game that they had planned, was actually to reach Jerusalem, was to get up on the Temple Mount, and to free the Al-Aqsa 
from the hands of the occupying Zionist regime, so to speak, right? And had they reached Jerusalem, had they reached the Temple Mount and achieved that goal, they would have created an uprising amongst the Muslim Arab jihadists in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, that would have turned out to be catastrophic. Yeah. And the real miracle of the October 7th uh, uh, massacre was the Nova Nature Festival. The terrorists had perfect plan as to who lived where, how many occupants in a home, where the family were going to be, where their bomb shelters were, which was part of the why they fired rockets first, knowing the Israelis would hide in their sh bomb shelters. So made it easy pickings for the terrorists. And they knew they just go straight to the bomb shelter, slaughter the family there, do whatever you want to do and move on to the next uh, uh, target. So all that was planned except for the Nova Festival. The Nova Festival was an insider party goer uh, deal that happened. And um, and that became a huge surprise for the terrorists. And when they got to the Nova Festival, they just they went on a full killing spree and that delayed them long enough for the first responders, uh, the special forces uh, units that responded first that ended up engaging with the terrorists and basically stop them from reaching their end goal, which, like I said, was uh, to enter Jerusalem and to occupy the Temple Mount, so to speak, in a in a bravado, you know, here we are, you know, come join us, brothers, in, in the uprising against the Zionist state of Israel. Um, so I think that's important for your viewers to hear and to and to realize that 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 um, this could have become a much worse tragedy. And um I can't even give numbers of what that would have looked like had they succeeded, but I can only imagine that thousands of people would have died. Many more thousands of people would have died had they achieved that goal. Um, so yeah, that was a very, you know, we, we missed the bullet, you know, we dodged the bullet there, so to speak um, on that day, as hard as it is to say that, and as hard it is, as it is to, to say that the Nova festival saved us from a much more worse catastrophe but th those are the facts that we found from uh, what we found in the field and through the information that game came through us. And I just thought that was crazy. And, and, and uh, we have a lot to be thankful for, you know, um, in light of this tragedy that we've uh, experienced, unfortunately. Well, mate, I think, I think we'll leave it there. Doran, mate, thank you again uh, for speaking to me for an extended period of time. I do really appreciate uh, your time, your insights, your knowledge uh, on this and giving a, a perspective um, from your side on the wall. So so thank you very much, mate. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate it. Cheers. And I'll see you soon, bro. Sounds good. Yeah. See you, mate. Bye-bye.